Welcome back to the TikTok show. I am your host, Ryan Heelan, and I could not be more excited about today's guest with over 500,000 followers on TikTok and over 100,000 followers on Instagram. My guest is changing the lives of people all across the world. Please welcome to the show, Eli Rallo. Eli, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Absolutely. Now, you are like your journey to where you are now is incredible. And you are just you seem like this person who just wants to help so many people. But we'll get to all that in a second. Just right off the bat, how are you with, you know, Christmas coming up in the holidays? How's how's life for Eli right now? It's good. I actually just I like had this crazy moment where I was like being an adult is so weird. I like bought a suitcase because I realized <laughs> that like all of my suitcases were like from my parents' basement and they were like falling right. apart. And I'm like traveling for the holidays like a billion times from now until December 25th. Of like course. I'll be everywhere. And so I had to buy a suitcase and it was like $300 and it just came and yeah. like I unboxed it and I was like, this is such a weird adult. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no. In that moment. <laughs> yeah, I got I got very lucky when I graduated high school. My grandma, her tradition is like she got gets all her grandkids like suitcases. So I was very lucky to. Yeah. I know, I know. It's one of those things. Like when I was in high school, I was like, Grandma, come on! Like I would like a computer, but like now that I'm traveling, yeah, exactly. But now that it's like I use my suitcase, I'm like, wow, what an amazing gift that that was. So you know, it, um, it's going to become a new thing to tell everyone to get this as a gift because like, oh yeah, absolutely. Need it. <laughs> yeah, and suitcases are one of those things that like. Hopefully it's a one-time purchase and like you don't have to buy another one and you know unless it gets lost yeah. or damaged. But suitcases are Christmas gift of 2022. Absolutely. Now, for people who who don't know who you are, how would you explain your who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I'm 24 years old. I'm originally from the Jersey Shore and I live in New York City. I'm a writer and an internet creator. I started on TikToks. So I'm like a TikTok native content creator. Mm -hmm. Most people would associate me with TikTok, but now also Instagram. I have a podcast and I'm writing a book and it's coming out next year. So a lot going on. I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan and Columbia's journalism program, their master's. So um, I still see all of my friends and Right. Deep loved ones from those times in my life. Um, very busy, but mm -hmm. it's very fulfilling. Yeah, I mean, that is quite the resume to have at 24. That's that's unbelievable. Now, do you feel you you named a lot of things like writer, TikToker, like Instagram? Is it hard to juggle all that stuff? Because I mean, that's a lot of different things to have to to work on this and then go to working on this. Is it ever hard to balance your life at 24? I think yes, but I'm also someone that's always been very busy. I'm very mm -hmm. high energy, um, pretty ADD. And the way that my ADD manifests is that I like to be doing a lot of things. I'm not very good at like relaxing and sitting still, which is like a blessing and a curse because yeah, it's, absolutely. Burnout, it's inevitable then. Um, but even when I was in college, you know, I was like producing all these shows and writing all of these things and working on the newspaper. And I was a waitress. Like I always kept myself that level of busy because it's like the way that my mind is racing. Like it, the only way to slow it down is to like get all the energy out. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, you know, a different version of that where like, I've never been as busy as I am now and like handling my schedule on a day to day basis wild, but I'm lucky that this was always sort of the way that I worked and the way that I operated was always like, go, go, go. So many different things going on as well on at once, a lot of different projects happening. So I'm glad that it's like a familiar feeling, but it's definitely crazy. Right. Yeah. Do you ever see yourself like having, I know people that create content online, like will take breaks from time to time. Do you ever see yourself having to, you know, for your own mental stability, taking a break or taking a step back from a, one platform or two? Yeah. So I've taken a couple of breaks from um, the, the, the internet as a whole. I took like a, a two week break at one point in the last two years, I've taken a day here or there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I've realized through the, those breaks is what I need is less so a cold turkey I'm not posting and more so the acknowledgement to myself that if I don't want to, I don't have to. Right. Whereas say like today, it's a Friday, it's 2 p.m. I posted twice. I have plans for two other videos going up by the end of the day. There mm -hmm. will likely be a third because something's going to happen that I'm going to want to record and put up like spur of the right. moment. Um, but I when I take a break, it's more so the acknowledgement of like, if I didn't want to sit down and create those other two videos that I have planned today, I don't have to. Um, and sometimes I'll decide I want to record something and post it. So when I take breaks, I make it look less like, oh, I can't post and I'm not. 
And right. more so, I don't have to if I don't feel like it. And whatever I feel like posting is what will go up today. So I think sure. that's kind of the way that I handle it. And that feels good for me. Yeah, I love that. I think like a lot of people, like when I started out on TikTok, it was I set myself a goal, like beginning of the day, you have to post four times. And if I didn't, I was like, upset with myself or feel like I wasn't meeting that goal that I had set out. And, you know, goals are important, but allowing yourself that time to like, take a step back and breathe and like, refocus on the things that you want to focus on, like, because you can get very caught up and swept into the mm-hmm. busyness of social media. So, you know, I love that. Um, now, I saw that you like a very strange goal of mine, you have already accomplished, you gave a TED talk at the University of Michigan. Yeah, which like bizarre. How how did that even you know, I know you went to school there, but how was that opportunity presented to you? Yeah, so it was pretty crazy. So most colleges and universities have like a chapter of TEDx. Mm -hmm. And like most like places have a chapter of TEDx, like in your city, you could look up like your city's TEDx conference. And it's typically like people from your city that are giving TED talks. And like, that's how their search works. Um, and you have to apply and whatnot, but they actually approached me. I was tailgating at, a, at the University of Michigan. <laughs> My brother was a senior and I was visiting and some girls stopped by the tailgate. They're like, we work for Michigan TEDx. Like, we're going to email you. But like, just wow. so that you have like a name to face before we email you, like we're, we run TEDx at Mish and like, we think that they'll choose you if you apply. And I was like, wow, that's such an honor. That's so cool. And I, I, you know, I majored in theater. So that was a big part of my undergraduate education and career. And I, I've always been pretty comfortable talking in front of people, but I hadn't done it in a really long time. Right. And I also hadn't memorized like lines for like anything in a very long time. So I was like, okay, like, we'll see. And so I applied, I got it. And then I had to memorize like a 17 minute long Ted talk. Right. But <laughs> it was like, strangely, I felt like I was back to like my old theater self, like at the rehearsal, I was really nervous and in my head and I forgot a bunch of parts and Mm -hmm. I was like kind of uncomfortable. And then like the day of, I I really like resonate with audiences and like the psychology of an audience is really interesting to me. Like, I don't know if you know this, but if you go see like theater or a concert and there's like, you know, a thousand people there, people's like heartbeats sync up. Mm -hmm. Like that's like what art in one place does to people I've always thought that was like really beautiful messaging so when I just like got up there I just like let the audience kind of take me in their energy and it ended up going so well better than I ever expected and I was definitely over prepared and like also really nervous but it was really fun and I recommend that you apply to do one in your area because it's like awesome yeah I mean like public speaking is like one of those things that like for a lot of people like brings a lot of anxiety and you know but I think Mm -hmm. once you're in the moment and like you do it and then it's over it's like wow that was almost like exhilarating like I really fed off the energy of of all that now I'm very interested in people you know you have a theater background which is great but the difference between when people who like create online versus um, going and speaking in public like is there a difference in like nervousness or like setup where you're making a YouTube video and like that is nerve-wracking in and of itself but then you're going and like speaking in, you know, on, on talk shows or on like Ted talks, like what is the difference in preparation and like emotion that goes through YouTube and like in person talking in front of people? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm pretty comfortable public speaking, but I'm like, I'm generally like a pretty introverted person. Mm -hmm. So the internet was like made for me because I can like do this all in my bedroom. Now I don't, I'm a very active person. You know, I have places that I go and work all the time, but I'm, I love the ease and flexibility of being online where I will get off the phone with you and I have these videos to shoot and I'm just going to shoot them like in my bed and it's like not a big deal. Um, Whereas like obviously being in person, there's a bit more pressure. Also, like I'm aware now that there's a lot of eyes on me. So the things that I say are always going to be scrutinized and Mm -hmm. can also be taken out of context. And so when I'm at home, I have the ability to like edit down or like think through what I'm going to say and obviously when you're in person and and public speaking you can also prepare sentiments and think through what you're going to say but when you're being interviewed you don't necessarily know what someone's going to ask you and you can't like prepare every answer to every question so I think it's that's definitely an anxiety of mine where I'm a written word kind of person not a spoken Mm -hmm. word so I'm very much so like in order to understand something I need to write it down in order to remember something I need to write it down in order to articulate what I'm saying if I get in a fight with you know my boyfriend or a friend I always write down what I want to say and it looks like I'm reading off a script but I'm like this is just how I make sense of things so it's a bit more difficult to do something like that when you're in person and like it's off 
film, you, you don't get to write it down. Um, so I think that's definitely a unique challenge, but I do love kind of the dichotomy. It's interesting. And I, and I like doing both. So I would say more public speaking to come in 2023, hopefully, but I'm enjoying the kind of, you know, back and forth that mm -hmm. I have right now. For sure. No, I've become like a huge advocate of like using your notes on your phone. Cause like there are yeah. like moments throughout the day where I'm just like, I know that if I don't write this down, I'll forget it. And I don't want totally. to, it could be like a thought or like something I see or something I want to like, this reminded me of you. And then I write it down and tell that person later. So yeah. I don't know, like thoughts are important to like keep and then share. And then you can also go back and look at them for like all the growth you've been through. I just, I'm a big advocate of, of writing things down. Absolutely. Now, in your TED talk, you know, and I think we see this in your content and just who you are, like you've created a platform that's based on authenticity and like self-confidence. Is that something that you really try to preach? You're like, what's your journey been in like finding your own self-confidence and authenticity and then having the ability to help others in that? Because it's hard enough to like find it on your own, but then to help others, is like a whole nother battle. So when did it become something you realize like, this is my journey and now I want to help whoever needs it with their own journey? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me, the TED Talk really does go over this in more detail than I can provide like now. Mm -hmm. But I think that what I kind of realized is that like I was like living in this like sector of self-loathing that like I chose to do that. Like obviously with things like depression and anxiety, we're not choosing to have depression. Like, and that's yeah. not what I'm saying at all, but I'm saying I was choosing to feel sorry for myself. I was choosing to hate my life. I was choosing to be negative and loathe everything. And I, I had this realization where I was like, I'm awake for like 14, 15, 16 hours a day. And I'm spending like 10 of those waking hours just in a cycle of self-loathing. And it's like, that's a choice. And yeah. it's also a choice to spend those 12, 13, 14, 15, however many hours in a cycle of positivity and affirmation and validation. And like, yeah, we should definitely feel the bad things too. And I don't feel great 24 right. seven. But for me, it was just like having that realization that like life is so short. And like, I was existing in this space of like, horrible self pity and just like dislike for myself. That was like something I was actively choosing to do every day. Yeah. And I was tired of it. I was like, I'm tired of this feeling. I, I want to feel happy. I want to feel uplifted. I want to feel bright. And so I just made the, the, the executive decision to <laughs> become someone who liked herself. And that yeah. was definitely difficult. But then once I did that, like I just started talking about it and I never intended to like give advice. Like I've always been deeply empathetic. I've always been an empath, but I never intended to like, I never like assumed a role where like I thought I had any sort of like agency to like give someone advice. But I right. realized like, think about when like you're going through a tough time or a breakup and like you call your buddy on the phone. Cause like, you know, that you trust his opinion and like you value him because you've you know, heard about what he's been through and you're like, he has valid life experience or sometimes he just knows what to say. Yeah. So whenever people are like, why do you feel like you have the agency to do this? I'm like, I don't, but neither does my best friend who I call for advice when I'm hysterical on the floor because I'm having a really bad day. Like right. I just trust her and I love her and I look up to her. And so I give her a call because I know she's going to have the right thing to say, maybe some tough love, maybe some gentle love, mm -hmm. maybe something in between. But I go to her because I trust her opinion. And I think I'm really, really lucky that people see me as that that best friend figure that they can call who also gets to be sort of unbiased for them because I don't know them or know the other person that might be involved in the situation. Right. Sometimes it is like really refreshing to get the perspective of like somebody who's not directly involved in a situation because they come yeah. in with just like, like you said, this unbiased of opinion or viewpoint of like, well, this is, you know, to me, it seems obvious this is what you should do. And then you go, yeah. wow, that makes a ton of sense. So yeah, a hundred percent. I love that. And, you know, I want to talk about social media because you know growing up and like having friends that are on social media all the time like having a younger sister who's on social media like why do you think it's easier for people to kind of hide themselves on social media or like brush over or like edit their insecurities as opposed to taking the steps in their real life whether that's you know therapy or like working out or like why is it easier on social media to cover your anxieties and you know things you don't like about yourself as opposed to taking real steps in your actual life to get where you want to get mentally. Yeah. I think it gets such a bad reputation, like people using Photoshop, people mm -hmm. blurring out their insecurities, people lying online. And I don't think it's necessarily the people that are doing that's fault. And I know that because that I was one of those people that used to do that kind of a thing. 
And I don't believe it's my fault because I believe that the societal expectations of like, not only just the beauty standard, but also just like pressures and like being a teenager and being 20 and like what that feels like in those like, what the fuck moments, like it is really hard to replicate, like to become the beauty standard in real life. It's impossible. But when we feel like we have no choice, we take to social media as a vice because we can do it there. We can get as close to the beauty standard as possible. We can make it look like we're thriving in the way that we feel like we're supposed to. So obviously that's negative and toxic and harmful. And it becomes a cycle because then other people see us lying and then they're like, Oh, I don't look that good. Now I have to lie. Um, and I, and I now strive to do the complete opposite of that behavior. But I do like, I empathize with why people do that because I think it's like a safety net. It's a vice. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I, I think it's like a larger conversation as to not villainize that, but like unpack why we feel the need to do that. Why does society put those pressures on us? Give yeah. us those expectations. And why do we do it on social media? It's because it's the easiest way that we can. Yeah. It's the easiest way to feel like we win in the eyes of society. So for me, there was like an active unpacking and like active work to be done to unlearn that behavior. And now like I said, I strive to do the total opposite of that kind of behavior. But at the same time, like I feel for the girl that did that and Mm -hmm. I know why she did. So I think it's really nuanced. I think it's something that we have to look at like kind of in a gentle way um, because those people really, what they need is to be like nourished and they need to find that confidence from within and they need to maybe find somebody online that they can look up to and they mm-hmm. can say, you know, I, I want to be more like them. Like, how do I yeah. become that level of authentic? Absolutely. And I think, like, loving people wherever they're at in life is, like, the first step uh, of healing or helping somebody, like, heal. Like, casting judgment on somebody who's already casting judgment on themselves so heavily is, like, never the correct way to approach a situation. And, you know, I think you said it best, like, being authentic is hard to do, like, in person. And I think, you know, a reason that social media can kind of play a factor on that is because you get like the quick uh, validation and like it's hard like if you go to the yeah. gym for like a month and you don't see the results like you don't get the validation in real life as you might whether if you're posting uh, a picture online and you edit it and somebody says oh you look great but in real life like you've been going to the gym for a month and nobody's noticed like the change in your body so a hundred percent you know I think it's it's very important to just like almost like you said like nurture people when they need it and like everybody needs it like I think we live I've had I've had more conversations with my friends in my 20s of like what are we doing like where do I want to go like all of these things that you struggle with from like your teenage years into college like you graduate college and now it's like what is the next step like who am Mm -hmm. I which is a huge huge question you know to have to try to answer yeah Um, totally now that you have kind of you know you went through college as a student and you graduated and now you are you know working in social media and you're an influencer are there any new challenges that you have had to overcome or like work on or you didn't see coming when you started this journey to become an influencer on social media I think the main one is like confirmation bias is a very real thing Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to people who are who are actively online um, which can be something that's troubling at first and I, I feel like I've gone through the full range of emotions about it but what I mean by that is like Com- what confirmation bias is, is like, if I decide that Taylor Swift is um, I'm trying to think of a good example, like if I create a story in my head that Taylor Swift's boyfriend, Joe Alwyn hates her right. and he only is dating her for fame, then I'm going to go ahead and look for details that would confirm that to be true. Oh, mm-hmm. did he not open a door for, door for her recently? Oh, was she spotted on a red carpet without him? Oh, this lyric in this song. And those details will be used to confirm the fake story. Now, I don't know Taylor Swift, so I have no idea if that's true. Frankly, it's probably not. Um, And I, and you know, that happens all day, every day where people will create fake stories about you and your life Mm -hmm. and what's going on based on what you've put out into the world. And then they're going to look for details that confirm that to be true. Oh, oh, she is, um, her boyfriend's going to break up with her and um, he's just waiting and all of these things. And here's all the reasons, here's all the details that confirm that to be true. And in reality, I'm the happiest I've ever been. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could, you could like be on a a business lunch with like somebody you're working with a business and someone's like, Oh, like that's not her boyfriend. Like, why is it, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Or like her friends hate her. Like they're only hanging out with her. She brings them to these things. Like, here's how I know, Mm -hmm. like, I listen to her podcast and this is, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, and it's yeah. kind of obsessive in a way. And I think at first when that was happening to me, I, I was defensive. Cause I was like, well, that's not true. Like I, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. Like 
I feel like I'm a good person. Like my friends do love me. Like I have this great relationship with all these people. And then I like took a step back and, and I realized, you know, I know what's true about my life. I right. know that I'm happy. I know that I think I'm a good person. I know that I'm working really hard. So why do I care what anybody else thinks? Like, you know, those opinions of me aren't my business. And so mm -hmm. once I realized that it really set me free and now I couldn't care less. Like, yeah, I didn't say what you like about me. I'm just going to keep, you know, collecting my checks and for sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it, it's like, a I, yeah, like I'm all good. So I think yeah. like, it, but it was a journey and I really wasn't expecting that. I also like, mm -hmm. I don't think that I'm like all that. So the fact that people are like <laughs> right. that obsessed, the fact that anyone is that obsessed with any internet content creator is beyond it's a little like scary you, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you must, you're almost more than a fan. Like the yeah. haters, like they go beyond fan behavior. Like they like me yeah. more than my fans do. Yeah. Um, so I think that was a unique challenge, but I'm definitely on the other side of it now where I'm feeling much more like confident and secure mm -hmm. and just really grateful. Like there's no negative, like negativity coming to me, um, as, as it relates to how I feel about my job and myself. Yeah. Well, good for you. Cause I know like a lot of times, like through experiences, that's where we learn the most about ourselves and you kind of went yeah. through all that and then came out on the other side, like more confident, more like sure of who you are and true to who you are. So, you know, that's amazing. Now I know you are like in the process of doing so much and, you know, you're writing a book and you're doing all these amazing things. You have a podcast. Did you like, what do you hope that social media can kind of help catapult you to doing? Cause I don't know if social media was something you like always dreamed of doing, but is it just like a stepping stone to get to where you want to get next? Like, what do you feel like really passionate about moving forward? I love social media. I've always loved Instagram. I never mm -hmm. like expected it or like tried to make it happen, but I'm so right. grateful I did. Um, I think like I'm a writer first, creator second. And I always say that. And I, and I would like to keep continuing on that path and like kind mm -hmm. of carve it out for myself. Um, I also love hosting and interviewing people and talking. So I would love to like have my own talk show or just yeah. see where the blows me in that direction as well. Um, for now, I'm kind of just trying to take it one day at a time because things are so crazy. But I would say those are like my top two, like hosting and writing are like really important to me. And that's where I would love to see um, myself sort of bend in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you have a knack for it and a talent for it. I mean, we can already see that, but yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's awesome. Now we're seeing like this wave of like social media becoming jobs that people want and like people want to work towards social media. I think in the past it was kind of just, Oh, this fell into your lap kind of thing. Congratulations. But now we're seeing people like actively want to be influencers. Do you have any advice for people who, who see you and want to do what you do? I think consistency is key. And a mm -hmm. lot of people that want to do this get discouraged because they know that there are success stories of people that blew up overnight. Mm -hmm. And that's so real, right? And it can happen to anybody. And that's the whole mm -hmm. thing of it. But if you're trying to do it, that could happen to you, but it's not the most likely outcome. What you should do is post three times a day, every single day for like six months and just yeah. see what happens. See right. what the growth is. And that's hard because people are like the instant gratification isn't there. I didn't blow up overnight. I'm discouraged. I'm quitting. Or if they simply don't have the time, they simply don't have the energy. But if you really, really want it and your want is so deep for it, then I would just say you have to consistently post. And who cares if no one sees it? Maybe someday somebody will. Right. Um I think that the proof is in the pudding. We see people that end up gaining a following that tried really, really hard every single day to get that following. And that's great. Yeah. yeah. Now, kind of on the flip side of that, who did you look to when you were doing this for inspiration? Like who are some of the people you strive to work like or have their work ethic or do things that they do? Who, who kind of was that for you when you were growing up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I love Reese Witherspoon and Drew Barrymore. Mm -hmm. I just think that they're moguls. Uh, everything yeah. of the sport really like pivoted their careers and uh, pursued things that were really important to them and make people feel heard on a daily basis. Um, in terms of like the content creating space, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's just so many amazing yeah. talented content creators that I look up to. But I think Reese Witherspoon, Drew Barrymore. Um, and then in terms of like writers and personalities, I love Cheryl Strayed and um, Glennon Doyle. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like those two are two people that they have podcasts, they have media appearances, they do social media, but they're writers. So I think those four would be like four people, four women that really did like, I looked to them through all of this just as like, kind of like cornerstones or like mm -hmm. people that I like really looked up to. Right. Well, that's awesome. Now, is there anything you can tell us about what's coming up next for you with your book or like things you have planned in the next couple months or the next year? Can you leave 
uh, us with anything moving forward. Yeah, so the book's going to be coming out in September, late September, I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of the goal. So there'll be pre-order in the summer. There's going to be a book tour after that. I'm thinking that I'm going to, after this first book, probably pitch for a second, but yeah. I think I'm going to take a little bit more time with it because this one was an expedited process. And I'm also looking into screenwriting and playwriting to go back to my roots there. So yeah. stay tuned for all of that good writing stuff. Wow. Well, that's all super exciting. Eli, thank you so much for being here. I, I genuinely cannot wait to see everything that happens in your career. You are unbelievably talented and it's just really been awesome to learn and talk with you. So, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Absolutely. Guys, make sure you go follow Eli on all social medias, on TikTok, Instagram, her YouTube. They will all be linked below. You will not want to miss everything that she has coming up. Thank, thank you. you.